There's an objection. Um, we'll, we'll go to 10-1, which is our item before us, which is the discussion of the River First schematic design, technical reports, and next steps. Andrew. President, excuse me, President Irwin, Commissioners, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn this over. I'm going to give you a brief introduction and turn it over to our uh, consultant teams uh, quickly, but I just wanted to frame it up with a couple of comments. Uh, I'm here to talk uh, to you about some very exciting work, some really exciting ideas uh, representing the future, not just of uh, the park system, but really uh, influencing the growth and, and uh, betterment of our city. And I think you'll see that in the imagery. Uh, I'll introduce, uh, after I'm done speaking, I'll introduce John Commerce, and he'll give you a, a preview of work in progress on some finance strategies uh, that relates to the second item, which is uh, the final products of the schematic design work uh, that's uh, the our consultants have been working on since August. Um, Tom Leader Studio and Kennedy and Violich Architects have been working on schematic designs for several projects, and you'll see summaries of those. Um, really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You're seeing the uh, compelling imagery and getting the descriptions, but uh, it's backed by a whole uh, stack of technical reports that will uh, help us walk through the permitting process uh, processes, which are very complex for all of this work, uh, as well as uh, actual working drawings, uh, hardline architectural drawings. So you're seeing the, the cream, if you will, the renderings and the colored imagery, but really there's a lot of technical uh, rigor behind all that. I wanted to make that point. Uh, second, I want to say this is a work of many people. You're seeing uh, the team leads, but there's a large team, including uh, some of my own colleagues, uh, park board staff. I want to thank especially Lisa Beck uh, and her team for uh, contributing to this work. It's been very helpful as we've tried to model uh, the demands that these new parks would place on our maintenance and operations staff. That's very helpful for planning our future. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that the work that you'll see is uh, emerges from the River First vision, but this is very much about implementation. These are projects that are uh, meant to be buildable. Uh, on a, it's uh, really, it's about uh, implement, implementation. It's not about uh, the vision anymore. Um, finally, the, everything you'll see is a call to partnership. The, the park board's shown leadership uh, in pursuing this vision and pursuing the schematic design. Um, but if you'll recall, the River First vision document uh, highlights the fact that all of the projects in River First are matters for uh, partnership. Uh, no one agency uh, can implement any of these things alone, and I think that's important to keep in mind. That you'll see that as we uh, present these ideas. So very quickly, uh, the background on this uh, goes back to before, well before the Minneapolis Riverfront Design Competition. These ideas uh, build upon even the uh, Above the Falls work and even ideas before that for the Upper River. Uh, and the, this work, is in specific, this schematic design work, comes from uh, the board's direction in 2012, uh, approving the vision and, and directing staff to pursue this schematic design work. Uh, our process in, for community engagement has been to work with three advisory committees. Uh, the AFCAC especially, the Above the Fall Citizens Advisory Committee has been very helpful. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Chamberlain. The, uh, <laughs> we've been working with... I'm trying to go too quickly. Uh, we've been working with three advisory committees. They've been very helpful, long-standing committees who are, are very well grounded in the, in the history uh, and stakeholders of these areas. That's been very helpful. We've held two public, op we will hold two public open house meetings. We held one in January. I want to let everyone know that the second open house will be held in this room, in the boardroom, tomorrow, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we've uh, publicized that through numerous venues. Uh, as I mentioned, we've done internal uh, outreach with our staff. That's been very helpful. And uh, the River First Initiative, the Minneapolis Parks Foundation staff, has helped us to get the word out through uh, not just the websites, but news releases uh, and advocating one-on-one uh, -on -one with decision makers. That's been very helpful. So where do we go from here? Um, you'll, uh, you'll, you're eager to see the ideas, but I think we're already thinking about next steps. So first we need to uh, continue to build momentum. Uh, we're already thinking about uh, ways to activate the sharer site this summer. Um, we need to pursue fundraising strategies. That's what you'll hear uh, about from John Commerce. Um, I want to make this point again that not only does this work represent a lot of new park land, but these are new kinds of parks that we don't currently have in our system. These are some real challenging uh, spaces that we're hoping to build. Um, and we need to establish uh, uh, project readiness. We need to queue these projects up. Uh, even further than we have, and that involves reaching out to our partners to co-sponsor permits uh, for some of the more challenging projects. Uh, we need to continue the land acquisition programs that have been so successful recently uh, for the Park Board, uh, and we need to continue to coordinate with our sister agencies, specifically the city on uh, 26th Avenue North and other 
projects, again, emphasizing the uh, partnership aspect of this. Uh, I'll just make a couple of quick points before I turn it over to John. Every project that you'll see uh, has a funding gap of, of one magnitude or another. This illustrates uh, the funding gap for uh, the Sharer Park in Halls Island, the park on the Sharer site. Uh, there's, we have an estimated construction budget, um, and on the left you see the park board's uh, funding that's available through the, uh, the foreseeable capital improvement plan years. And so that gap is really what John Carmers will be talking about. That's the goal for the fundraising strategy. Uh, John will also be talking a little bit about uh, next steps, and this is in the document that you have and it will be available on the web after this meeting. We've tried to set a calendar of implementation years so that these projects are phased but continually being uh, implemented one after the other. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Commerce. He'll talk about uh, funding strategies, and that work is in progress, and he'll be followed by uh, Tom Leader Studio and Kennedy and Violich Architects, and they'll talk about the schematic design work for the projects. John? Mary DeLate, uh, the executive director of the Minneapolis Parks Foundation, is going to introduce this. <laughs> President or, or Chair Irwin and commissioners, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and more importantly, it's really a pleasure to introduce John Commerce, who's the founder and principal of Donjek. Um, John is creating the finance strategy for River First, and he's been working like an absolute dog over the last six months on this. Um, he is going to give you a brief overview of things tonight, but you will actually, um, tomorrow you will have multiple opportunities to see the full Monty of what it is that he's been doing. But really what you're going to see is, is not only a very compelling story about River First and how to, how to fund it, but also a roadmap on how to implement River First in its next phases. So he's going to introduce to you not only his research, um, but funding sources, as well as very, very comprehensive funding strategies, and ultimately concluding with the call for partnership, uh, which I, I'm hoping we will move forward on. So without further ado, it's John Commerce. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Superintendent Miller, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm, my intent is just to speak for a few minutes. Uh, and this presentation is really the beginning of a series of conversations over the next uh, day and a half. And I hope that to have the chance to, to talk further with, uh, with you about details as we get further into uh, those events. The funding strategy that uh, I've been working on uh, in conjunction with a team that I formed to support me with development and research expertise really is broken into four pieces. The first is looking at the attributes of the River First area. The second is uh, interviews and research, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the premise of doing those uh, interviews and conducting that research. But those two things together lead to the third piece, which is a projection of funding by source for priority projects. And then lastly, looking at case studies around the country of projects that have been effectively uh, capitalized uh, with public and private sources, and then also uh, where sustainable operating and maintenance models have been put in place to ensure uh, the integrity of the assets that have been uh, built in the first place. The first piece is relating to the uh, analysis of the attributes of the River First area. And this is an example, uh, one of just a couple of examples I wanted to offer, uh, mapping an examination of data uh, on a range of fronts. We looked at property values down to the parcel level. Uh, we looked at demography. We looked at density, uh, population density. We looked at income characteristics. And the whole premise of conducting this kind of work is to understand uh, areas of strength or areas of weakness, areas of community stress, and really using that set of findings to tailor our uh, pitch to uh, public agencies as partners or foundations as, uh, as funding partners for, uh, for these projects. So this map shows uh, property within one half mile of the north side wetlands uh, upper harbor area. On the left you see estimated market value by parcel. On the right you see uh, market value uh, per square foot of land. You get a sense of some of the trends that are, that are at work here. The next map uh, shows the uh, residents of color as a proportion of total population by census tract. Uh, and you can see that the citywide uh, 
average of uh, communities of color is 37 percent of the total population in Hennepin County. It's, it's a lower number, but you can see the, uh, the patterns of, uh, of residency for communities of color um, in the River First project area. The next slide shows uh, trends of population density per square mile by census tract. And uh, you can see that uh, there are some patterns here as well. Um, let me move to uh, the next slide for in the interest of time here. A median household income is what's depicted here. You can see that uh, in the Central Riverfront area, you've got uh, a st substantial concentration of um, a pretty substantial uh, median household income, and uh, that there are areas in the map um, as you move up river that are uh, that have substantially lower median household incomes. This map depicts the population uh, under 20 years old by census tract. And you can see again a similar reflection of the uh, the median household income map where around the central riverfront you've got relatively low incidence of, of young people living in those areas and as you move up river there are more and more young people uh, in those census tracts. That's a little bit of, a, of an example of some of the mapping we've done. This is just a very small snippet of the, of the data that we've uh, crunched and analyzed using uh, GIS technology. Uh, but the premise again is to understand what the trends are so that we can really tailor the case for uh, public partners and foundations to uh, invest in the riverfront or river first uh, priority projects. Let me next just talk for a moment about the interviews that I mentioned earlier uh, with stakeholders and funders. We interviewed uh, uh, nearly 40 uh, folks from the business community, uh, prospective contributors and champions for this work, uh, civic leaders, program officers, and others who were um, who are interested in River First and its prospects. Just to uh, describe some prominent themes that we heard from, from these voices, there's a lot of interest in River First and moving the, the entire investment program forward. There's a sense that funding is contingent on a unified case being made and with a strong position in what is a competitive landscape. There are a lot of competing uh, and, and compelling downtown uh, initiatives that are being talked about are being advanced and it's pretty crucial that River First is positioned very strongly in that field. Each priority offers a hook and a basis of interest. I should say each priority project so uh, particularly neighborhood uh, focused uh, voices are, are most drawn to one or another of the priority projects. It's important to harness that and at the same time uh, take advantage of the fact that River First is not just a collection of, uh, of smaller projects. It's a, it's a transformative, much larger uh, regional, even statewide vision. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we heard clearly from, from folks that there was an interest in taking advantage of opportunities to demonstrate the value now, uh, demonstrate that case to funding partners as we move forward. This slide depicts uh, the work that we've done looking at each priority project and projecting the composition of capital funding that uh, we think is, is uh, likely to, uh, to move each project forward. What we've done here is uh, take the research from the interviews and from research on a range of public sources ranging from uh, Park Board itself to federal sources uh, state, regional, and local sources and projected what the opportunities for each of those sources to meet uh, line items in each of the uh, priority project budgets uh, will be. I want to just call out the fact that the purple, green, and, and red pie wedges here, if you will, are really what, uh, what we've long depended on for moving uh, park projects forward. This is, I think, an opportunity to extend into uh, private sources to navigate the waters that are, that, that are associated with that to forge partnerships with individuals, with corporations, and with foundations, um, as, well as, uh, as well as federal partners to, to move these projects forward. 
<coughs> as Andrew mentioned, we're also looking at case studies, both in order to learn more about how they assembled capital to move their projects forward, but also what kind of models they've put in place to ensure the, the long-term operating and maintenance uh, of those spaces. And this is a, a listing of some of the case studies that we've examined um, in, that, in that process. I realize that this has been a very quick walkthrough of this work. Um, there's a lot more to talk about, and I wanted to list these events um, uh, for you. I hope that we'll have a chance to talk further about it. Tomorrow morning, I'll be presenting at much more length about uh, the findings of the funding strategy. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for John at this time? Andrew? Yeah. If President Irwin, if, it's, uh, if it uh, pleases you, I was going to introduce the design team and have them present uh, so that we could have. So I'm going to ask you your advice, Andrew. We have a time certain public hearing at 630, which is in five minutes. Yeah. So, Andrew. President Irwin, commissioners, thank you. Uh, I'll invite uh, up to the podium Tom Leader of Tom Leader Studio and Frano Violich and uh, Sheila Kennedy of Kennedy and Violich Architects. Uh, and Maura Rock Castle is also here from Tom Leader Studio. And it's yes, great if, if each of you could, Tom, I know you're soft spoken, if you could talk into that yeah. mic. Pull, no, no, talk into that mic. <laughs> I'm going to start the slideshow just to prove that I know how to do that. <laughs> Bigger picture, yeah. Thank you. Oh, Mora. Wait, 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 wait. I think someone is that a car alarm out there? In the meantime, that's. I think we're we're competing here. Yeah, it's been car alarm car alarm on for a while. Very good. <laughs> Good evening, um, Commissioners. Um, <laughs> President Irwin, we're just going to begin in the interest of time. Um, as um, Bruce Chamberlain um, and Andrew mentioned, River First is a large team based project, and this first slide just speaks, uh, reminds you of all the participants, including uh, many firms uh, here in Minneapolis and regionally who've worked on this project. Um, You've heard and read um, this presentation before. We're not strangers. We've been working on this project for some time. But I just wanted to mention that this project in the large picture is about joining. It's about linkages, linkages between flows of urban water and natural water in the river, linkages between communities on the north and northeast and between the upper river uh, section of the Mississippi and downtown. It's also about linkages between biodiversity and urban life, and also linkages between the agencies and partnerships um, that um, Assistant uh, Commissioner Chamberlain uh, spoke to. So I would just go back for one second to point out that <clears throat> the effort over the last seven, eight months, whatever it's been, has distilled our efforts down into five basic projects that have been really developed in enough detail that they're like kind of ready to go. Now, we know how much they cost. Uh, we know what the shortfalls are. We know what's involved. We know what's the permitting. We know what are all the most of the materials and uh, environmental issues. Those five projects are a connector at Lowry Bridge to get off the bridge and down to the down the riverfront, a connector at uh, a, a pier at the end of 26th Avenue, uh, connecting with the city project to develop bike lane all the way past Farview Park and down to the river and to bring people out on the, on the, on the water in, on a pier. Number three would be a, a, a important trail that would link from Greco up as far as BNSF Bridge uh, and connecting the, the northeast side down with, with Shearer Park. Number four, uh, improvements to Plymouth Bridge uh, using the fact that it is going from four lanes to two to uh, uh, dovetail with the city project and create new pedestrian and bicycle experiences there. And number five, Shearer Park in Halls Island, uh, which would hopefully be the, the, the flagship park open space of, of the project. Trails. Like Sheila said, this is about linkages and it's about loops. And we've spoken to you before about imagine a series of interconnecting rubber bands that go up and down the river. 
and these use the bridges as their foundation and they wrap around the sides. So we have trails that need to get up onto bridges that you need to be able to walk across, bike or pedestrian, and then you'd wrap down the other side. This allows the, the back doors to become the front doors. Uh, it allows the, uh, the, the incremental development of a trail system that you can eventually move all the way to the north and to finally uh, get to the uh, complete the grand rounds. What you see on the left is the, uh, the current map of the, of the trails we're trying to accomplish. Um, now, we need a series of uh, places of interest, itinerary that you follow as you go around this initial loop that you're seeing from Shear Park up to BNS and down the other side. So as you move north, there's a whole series of uh, locations that have been developed in more detail, overlooks, uh, uh, habitat spots, places to get views over, places where we use existing parks and you cross Lowry Bridge. Uh, you you uh, then use the Lowry connector and you proceed down to the uh, uh, 26 Avenue overlook and on down through the existing piece of the trail so, so that this is an interlinked uh, uh, initial s series of segments that make sense together and it's a series of ex experiences that unfolds as you move. Not all of the trails are so easy to connect as, as I think we all know because of land acquisition and especially uh, on the north side we have industries which are active. Uh, we, we are challenged to make this connection of the trails because from the very beginning it's been all about uh, these connections and a uh, consistent uh, and acce accessible riverfront. So here in this slide you see where the design team has taken a very strategic affordable approach. You see on the left, uh, on your left, uh, Pacific, Ave uh, Pacific Street, uh, two views actually, the top and then the lower one showing how we can, through just paint, through very simple means of recycled wood um, and wayfinding signage, we can make these connections that are really difficult to make because we don't have, in certain cases, parkland to work with. On uh, 26th Avenue Pier, um, this is a, a really important strategic site because on, north, on the north side, we don't have the kind of uh, land and the representation that we need to really impact north side. So there are a couple of sites. The first is uh, the overlook at 26th. It's at the end of the greenway, uh, which the city is working on. That greenway is, is, doesn't go quite to the river, so we've extended that so that, as you all know, uh, we are working, we've designed the wood, this wood pier. It's a very affordable wood pier. Next, Sheila. Um, and that, that, that wood pier uh, is something that is accessible. There's a trail, an, uh, an accessible trail that goes down to the river's edge. Uh, and here you can see views of how the River Talk um, system that Sheila will talk about uh, allows the public to access um, the site in very different ways. Sheila's going to talk about the other north side uh, connection, which is at Lowry. Uh, the River Talk um, application is a mobile phone, phone application that's been proposed that would have a lot of public outreach and educational content about the historical sites. For example, here on North 26th Street, uh, historically 26th Street did touch the river and we're restoring that ability to go all the way from Worth uh, down through the new trail to, to actually uh, touch the Mississippi River and engage in it. Um, some of the connections that we're making are new connections. Um, this is the Lowry connector which connects from ground level up to the new Lowry Bridge. We're looking at an aerial here. And here is that in plan with uh, Pacific here. And we have uh, have uh, proposed a very simple earth mound that would be earth moved from the Shearer Park construction that provides a very slow gradual ramp that you see here that would bring bicyclists and pedestrians up to the level which is about 20 feet higher than grade so that they can easily get on to the Lowry Bridge and cross over on the new bike <laughs> lanes there uh, to the northeast side. And below in the perspective you see a view of this as it would look even today looking down Pacific to Lowry Bridge. Um, and then again the aerial where you see the kind of overview of this. This is an important point to scoop up the traffic of people who are moving up to Lowry Bridge and crossing over even before the port uh, lands are, uh, are acquired as part of this. We also have a proposed future West River extension which we think is very important and this design also doves tails into and provides for the future when in fact this land may become a part of the park system. 
Um, these are the uh, floating islands, uh, floating wetlands. Um, this is um, a feasibility study, and we've really simplified uh, the floating islands to a very simple module, which you can see here, which can then be accrued and tethered in a very simple manner. And these modules are of a size where they can be removed by boat if they need to be in a very easy manner. The purpose of the floating wetlands is to jumpstart both the carrying capacity on the river and also the bioremediation um, through the plant life and the roots, which um, reach down into the water and help in a natural way um, remove some of the imp impairments in the Mississippi. I would love to talk about Plymouth Bridge. It's my favorite site. Um, we've been working, as you may know, uh, with the city on trying to find ways to integrate both their agenda and our agenda uh, together. Um, and we've come with, uh, with this proposal. Um, it's a, a very strategic way to, um, to provide for additional bike lanes for, uh, that dovetails with the city's plans, that allows for access uh, to the, to the um, to the river's edge, but in a very different way than you find now. It's just not, it's not just like going from point A to point B, but there's actually places to sit. There's the signage that I mentioned previously. And probably most importantly is that it becomes a threshold point to, uh, to Shear Park beyond. So why not dovetail the proposed changes in lanes that, that we've been uh, working with the city on with a green bridge, a green Plymouth bridge um, with live materials, overlooks, and really making a very strong public amenity and public connection to the new Shearer Park area. This is simply a, a winter scene, as you can see. Um, but it, what it does show is the kind of activities that continue to happen over, for, over the four seasons. And that the, uh, the beginning of Shear Park and, and, its, and the park support building, which you can see in the distance, that is programmed with, with a cafe and boathouse, all make this connection uh, from one side of the river to the other occur. The bridges are really important links, and I think Plymouth Bridge is, is a critical uh, element in that. Sure, Park. Um, we imagine this to be your first uh, major flagship open space, your first credential, you know, in the whole efforts that's been going on for a couple of years. Let me just review the principles of, of why it's being designed this way. Uh, the idea is essentially to make the river uh, the centerpiece of the park. That is the amenity. We don't need to invent some other uh, object or thing. We we are actually we're recreating Halls Island, which used to exist. We're bringing a, a back channel in, and then we're providing access down to this water, uh, both for people and for animals. And then we're framing that space with really two programmatic uh, flanks. One is the park support building that you see uh, right here. And the other is, is a, uh, a zone for development, which is uh, we're in a, uh, proceeding more in the RFP stages. It would hopefully arrive at a massing, something like that. We've done guidelines and a sustainability uh, direction for all that project. I can speak to yeah. those. As Tom was saying, um, we've developed a sustainable design guideline that operates at two different scales. At the urban scale, um, the guidelines talk about the relationship between um, Plymouth Bridge and the new park with a gateway, establish a threshold on Sibley Street, and provide a, a, a volume of possible massing um, be, that would mitigate between um, the new park and uh, Graco. At the scale of architecture, we've described um, how orientation is important and all the kind of very important passive moves that should be made about daylighting, natural ventilation, providing for shading and providing for view corridors, as well as the really important points of um, public circulation and access uh, on this site. Um, this is an extended document, and I, I invite you all to read it um, at your leisure. So the way this park works uh, is a couple of things. Number one is you pass through from Sibley and from the corner uh, through a zone which really ought to be uh, about addressing the community. We'd like to see farmers markets. We've heard you might be interested in that too. Things that address the community needs, festivals, w ways for people to get together. Uh, right there at the, uh, in the, what we call the panhandle, for lack of a better term, right here. And you pass through that zone, and then you descend through a series of terraces. And these terraces are about uh, 12, 12 to uh, 15 inches high. Uh, the, each one of these edges is, is wood and it's sitable, and it's arranged to create essentially a theater space, if you'll allow me to use that term, 
which is grouped and, and arranged around the beach and around the water itself. So it's a, trying to be a theater of the water. And you can have a, a big concert here, or you can look at the water, and you can look at Halls Island. Both of those things should work equally well. All these terraces are available for picnicking, individual groups, or you can, you can probably seat 1,000 or 2,000 people for a big gathering. And then at the center of it all, of course, is the back channel. And then facing you is another beach, which is the, the way that habitat is able to access the water. And Halls Island is really uh, primarily a habitat experience. We're letting people come out on a bridge across and then circle all the way around and, and then complete a, a loop back to the mainland. And here you see how those terraces might feel. Uh, we're using a lot of, uh, uh, we're using primarily native riparian material, which will reinforce a natural bias whale, which will clean water wherever we can do it and get lowest to agree. Uh, you see the beach beyond. And we're, tr we're trying to use uh, uh, more rusticated, natural, appropriate materials. This is not a high-tech, uh, hard-edge park as much as it's more like this. It's trying to welcome you down and embrace the river. That's the, the basic point we're trying to make here. Uh, this is a, a early, this is something we could do uh, as a, kind of a phase 1A, rough grading and seeding the site as an initial project. Uh, we've looked at other scenarios if we can't achieve the Halls Island that we all like to see. So we have a scheme B, we have a scheme C. Um, let's see, I think, Bonnie, you were going to come in on the, the park support there. Well, yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, the, the uh, architectural design team has been working very hard to create a, a park support building which is affordable. Um, it, it actually uses the, uh, some of the excavation to create a mound, as you can see here in this image, in order to kind of prop the park, uh, the park support building up. We also did some research in terms of square footages of this building. This building is about 17,000 square feet, which is ideal for National Park Service headquarters. Um, and then beyond, you can see an independent building, which is the cafe and the boat uh, and the boathouse beyond. So you've heard us before on Halls Island. We've uh, we've done all of our homework in terms of hydrology, in terms of permitting, and we all feel together, I think, that we should go for the best option, which is option A. And that goes for, uh, especially for uh, sediment control, for maintenance, and being able to perpetuate this scheme into the future. Whenever you mess with the river, you've got to be very careful. You've got to know exactly the velocities and the sediment load, how it drops out. We don't want to dredge it and so forth. But we do want to produce what you see along the bottom, which is making Halls Island the most rich, diverse, a uh, series of, uh, of ecologies we can we can interweave, um, and this is that experience that you have. This this is one th big sort of bowl of, of habitat and people and, and water uh, together, and some of the uh, more uh, informal aspects of circulation, uh, bridge bringing you out to Hulls Island, a small overlook, uh, bird blind which you would fall, track around on the island itself, so that the, uh, the 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 way of moving around is really suited to. Uh, uh, promoting uh, animal communities and not cutting across them. And now we have labored all day to make a very short animation for you guys, and we're going to make it happen here. How do we get to the desktop? Here we go. And play. Play again. It's got sound too, but I'll just tell you. This is the overview. This is entering from the corner at uh, Sibley and 8th, down rapidly to the beach through the terraces. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> long. 60 seconds. Yeah. Sprinting. Moving up toward the bridge, toward Halls Island, across the back channel. The overlook, the island itself, the habitat beach, turtles breeding maybe. <laughs> The, uh, bird blind? The, the bird blind with the raised boardwalk, existing lighthouse that remains, new bridge back to the uh, mainland underneath the bridge, the uh, boathouse and cafe. All lead platinum. <laughs> Series of, of <laughs> uh, overlooked terraces that can also work as a, as a performance space on a smaller basis. The restaurant to the right, cafe to the right there. And on to Plymouth for a, a look back to the whole thing. It's one of the reasons Plymouth is so important, is to be, be able to connect those two into one, one piece of the loop that really stands for the whole project. And now, if we will, send, we will send you all of you a link to a five-minute version with beautiful sound and music, and you can watch in the pleasure of your own uh, bedroom. You, you <laughs>
The video is great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Irwin, commissioners, that's our presentation. Um, we'd love to discuss any questions you have. Thank you. Do we do we have any questions at all, Commissioner Walensky? I don't really have questions. I just I just have comments. It's wonderful. I love it. I want my beach. I want my island. Um, we, like Diane Hofstad, uh, Councilmember Hofstad said, everybody write a check before you leave the building tonight. Um, no, this is an absolutely fabulous design. I love that little video. Um, I can't wait to get down there. We're hoping to program a couple things just at the big grassy space this summer just to let people know that we are getting forward. And God, it would be great if we could put that video up on a screen there. So. Uh, thank you all for all the hard work you've done. I'm looking forward to seeing a more lengthy presentations tomorrow. Any other questions? And that's something, a good point to bring up. Um, there's an opportunity for commissioners to hear tomorrow at, I think, 11 o'clock. That's right, President Irwin. There are t uh, two open houses. In addition to the River First Steering Committee at 7.30 a.m., there's an open house uh, that's specifically for commissioners and park board staff. The public's notified and welcome to attend as well. So that open house is uh, at 11 a.m. here in the park board uh, in the meeting room. And then the full public open house with a longer presentation and audience Q&A, that's 6 to 8 p.m. Okay. So commissioners have any questions of the design team at this point? Or do you want to wait till you see the whole? Looks great. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Commissioner Cumber. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do know that there is a little bit of an issue over the restoration of Halls Island regarding the DNR and that had you anticipated that legal problem when this design came up and when did that get filled in do you folks know that uh, it was filled uh, 19 well basically when the barges started operating uh, okay. it was going to reattached to the shore, kind of pushed over against the shoreline and, and a new shoreline out further out into the water, right. which was armored so that they could uh, unload lumber there and, and have, be safe from barge wake. So they needed to harden the edge at that point when all the barges started. What year was that? Like 1963, I think the barge traffic started. 63? Yeah. That's, that's right. Uh, uh, President Irwin, Commissioner Cummer, um, my colleague Renee Leone and I actually researched this with the city and pulled the, uh, the city council's records uh, from when this was approved, when the transfer of land was approved. Uh, I believe it was 64, 65, uh, right at the period of uh, the channelization of the river. Hmm. So it's pretty I, well documented. I'm amazed it was that recent. It's that recent, but it precedes the DNR's um, regulatory purview on the river. So there's a little bit of a... Okay. Yeah. Who had purview at, on the river? Just the Army Corps of Engineers at the time? The, the, it was the city uh, giving permission uh, on behalf of the, the other city. state agencies. Yeah, the city owned the property. So the process at that time wasn't quite as rigorous as it, as it is today. Really? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Mr. Vreeland. Just to add to Dr. Hall's history, uh, David Smith has, has written about uh, Dr. Hall, and it's a fascinating history of what happened on the island, and it was uh, originally uh, acquired uh, by Dr. Hall, Hall to um, uh, store dead animals and garbage, and it became a public bathhouse instead. So, <laughs> a fun place. <laughs> so, I can't wait to um, see plaque. yeah, I want to. Uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Walensky just reminded me to thank uh, Representative Kahn and Senator Diesick because they're working on trying to get us permission to be able to do this project and um, recreate Falls Island. We never, th Halls Island, never thought it would be so difficult to recreate something that was already there. <laughs> just a few years ago. <laughs> just a few years out. ago. Thanks for coming. Thanks for putting up with car alarms, hissing gas, and all <laughs> kinds of <laughs> all Thank kinds you. of things. Thank and you for I'll, I think some of us will be seeing you tomorrow morning at seven thirty. So. Okay.